Hello and welcome to 11FS Spotlight. I'm Jason Bates. In this weekly show, we'll shine a spotlight on the best and brightest in fintech, to try and understand what gets them going, growing, and what they think the future of the industry will look like. On today's Spotlight, I'm delighted to be joined by Ray Brash, CEO and Chairman of PPS. How's it going, Ray? It's going super nice, thank you. I'm very happy to be in our offices. Um, you know, that's a bit of a rarity around Europe right now, but uh, needs must. And uh, yeah, happy to be here and happy to be part of the uh, programme. Is it quiet there? It's a bit quiet at 11FS HQ, I can tell you. Well, actually, we've got a rule that um, if a particular task can be done more efficiently, then we do. That's a rule for coming to the office. And today I happen to have uh, my direct reports meeting. Uh, right now I have about 11. Uh, oh, wow. So we felt it was more efficient for them to come in. So they all come in. And it seems like a lot of other people have come in as well. So maybe obviously rumour got round that the CEO was coming in. So, <laughs> But we're all socially distanced and, uh, you know, we've got health checks and temperature checks and all that sort of thing. So we're being responsible about it. But it is pretty busy and it's, it's weird being in an office with more than one person in it. That's for sure. Sounds great. Well, on today's show, we're going to talk to Ray about his career, take a deep dive into PPS and talk about green fintech and what the landscape looks like there, because I understand that's a, uh, a key interest of yours, Ray. But maybe let's start off with, with PPS. We've got a, a fairly diverse international audience. What does PPS do? Yeah, PPS is essentially a payment processing issuer. What does that mean? Uh, if you're using your bank account or your card and you want to make a payment, there's a company behind that that's enabling that to happen. And that's pretty much what we do. We do a little bit more than just the, uh, the click and the acceptance because we're also a regulated business. So the money that is passed between your bank account and uh, the merchant, whether that's going via a scheme or via the banking system, we handle that as well. So we kind of travel the, the end to end um, and we also do it globally as well. So yeah, interested to, to speak to, out to your global audience because we're in uh, about 50, 60 countries in South America, Europe, uh, Middle East, as well as the UK. So, yeah, we're pretty global now. So there will be and there will be listeners of um, or watchers of the program who are probably using uh, our products. But I'd like to say our clients products as well. So how how long have you been involved in, in payments processing? Um, we've been well, I personally been here since 2003, 2004, I'm one of the co-founders. And um, that was my first kind of uh, entry into payments. But prior to that, I'd worked in um, sort of digital publishing um, uh, at uh, The Economist. And The Economist went through a sort of transformation from being an analog business to a digital business. And there's actually been a lot of comparisons over the last 17 years here because a lot of our clients have gone from kind of analog to digital. So I've seen the impact of that in a couple of different industries. So it's been pretty interesting, actually. And I guess cards processing or payment scheme processing has been at the, at the heart of a, a lot of the sort of fintech revolution. Um, you know, I guess payments processes largely started as parts of banks before they were sort of floated off and then were, if you forgive me, a somewhat unsexy part of the industry until lots of challenger banks and cards and crypto players started to come along. And suddenly payments processes seem to be the, uh, the key to unlocking a lot of that. Yeah, I think the we started life as a as a prepaid processor. And what's the difference between a prepaid processor? Most banks will use, you know, a, a processor that's connecting them up to um, the payment scheme with a very, very basic kind of yes or no. Prepaid cards, they're standalone products. So our platform essentially does almost everything in a bank and in a processing, but in, but in one platform. And a lot of our products in the early days had, I would say, non-traditional finance uses. So, you know, a bank is a bank is a bank. But some of our early cards were gift cards. So, you know, actually, whilst there was a payment being made, the real value in the proposition was, you know, I'm going to give a gift card to my wife to, for a clothes shop because I've no idea what size dress she is. Hopefully this, that bit gets cut out of the edit but anyway. Um, you know, and all of those, the kind of value add. So, for example, we also started working in the employee benefit space to enable companies to distribute employee benefits 
using the card system. And so prepaid was always, it wasn't just about, you know, financial transactions for the sake of financial transactions. There was always another means to it. And also prepaid processors like us were quite used to working with other brands. We launched the first prepaid card with Virgin Money, for example. And that, I think, meant that when the fintech kind of revolution started, you know, and obviously you you were at the the, the founding uh, part of that, and obviously guys like Monzo and all these sort of guys, their first kind of voyage started with companies like us mm. because you know they didn't they didn't have a banking solution, they weren't a bank, they didn't want to spend you know seventy five million pounds on a you know an integration to a major bank processor. And the prepaid guys like ourselves and, and others in the market, GPS, et cetera, you know, we were ready to work with them. And I think that's the that's one of the big differences. I mean, since then, we've developed our solution and we really expanded it. So we're probably closer to more of a traditional bank processor. But we still feel that those kind of value added transactions, um, mm. which is using the financial network, but it's not really about the payment. It's about what you do with the payment. And, and we, you know, we talk to clients about this move from commodity products to to intelligent services that actually, whether it's uh, Monzo or whether it's one of the business receipting or business uh, expenses providers or whoever, it's the it's the services that are built on top rather than the net interest margin and, and banking that seems to be, you know, driving a lot of this. And I guess working with, uh, you know, a partner that had APIs that you could connect into and build services on while, you know, you looked after the the regulated part and the the MasterCard and Visa part, uh, I guess was the key, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's about relative strengths, isn't it? You know, and it's also about proximity to the customer. I mean, the whole tech revolution has brought providers literally, you know, four inches close to their customer, okay? And that proximity means that there are people who understand the end users better than we do, you know? So we focus on making sure that sort of core part, the regulation, you know, the, the, the security, the connectivity, the global aspect is taken care of, which by its nature has to have elements of standard and security, you know, and it, it's probably, you know, it's not very personal, OK, but when we plug in to a client who has a very intimate uh, and a very kind of real time frequent relationship with um, with the customer, that's when it happens. And I think just going back to the whole prepaid thing, one of the other differences about prepaid processing compared to the processing of the day was it had to be real time. So we had to build a platform that would check a transaction in real time and check a balance in real time. That might sound a little bit weird nowadays, but a lot of bank processes, in fact, still the case, I'm sure many of, of the viewers and listeners will know that when they check their banking app on a Monday morning, they won't see any of the transactions that they actually spent over the weekend. And at some time around five o'clock that day, they might get an alert to say, oh, you've gone overdrawn. That's because bank processes are typically running in sort of batch or, you know, retrospective processing. Prepaid processes always had to be real time because there was no credit. It was what was on the card. And mm -hmm. that absolutely plays into the hand of the, of the fintechs who want to have that intimacy. So we really feel that we work, we don't have brands that we own ourselves. We work with brands like Tide or Manise or these sort of guys or Metal. And they understand their customers because they've acquired them. They're talking to them. They're providing other services. They have membership communities and all that sort of thing. And so it's their job to really understand them and to provide you know, many services, not just payments. And it's our job to plug into it and be one part of that component. And I think that's really how it how it's really worked. I guess banking as a service and banking as a platform are, you know, pretty much buzzwords now. But it sounds like you've been doing that all along. Yeah, it's, it's it is strange. You know, it's providing it's using the payment infrastructure for another reason, you know. 
And uh, like I said, we would have had products that were allowing people to, you, you know, buy their lunch with a tax benefit because it was a socially uh, a social cause for people to have nutrition in South America or in, in France or whatever. They happened to be using the MasterCard network or a private network, but the primary purpose was to enhance that person's experience, um, you know, a gifting product, an incentive product, um, you know, even a, even a travel card, you know, it's not just about the payment, it's about budgeting, knowing mm -hmm. that, you know, if you want to spend 500 euros, you can put it on a card and you know that you, when you come to the end, that's it, 500 euros, you don't get the shock of the credit card statement. So we've always been working with industry partners, brands, um, to really create value. And I suppose that's the service aspect of it. It is exactly as you say, banking, but being used for some other purpose. And so do you see, I assume you do see a future for prepaid cards and for prepaid accounts, because I guess the, um, the argument against prepaid is that it prevents, um, you know, organization from doing traditional banking, from net interest margin, from lending out those deposits. It's ring fenced. You know, none of those customer deposits are available to the organization. So obviously there's a, a whole revenue sort of set that's prevented. Um, is there a future for prepaid or will everyone move to to providers that you know that offer other things yeah i think to be clear there's a difference between prepaid and e-money okay sure e-money e-money is the regulation that governs the holding of a of a float in a regulated program we actually do prepaid programs that aren't regulated for example so that doesn't come into play but also as the financial service industry has expanded and there's many more partnerships and many more players, we actually work with banks now. So, you know, we do processing of card transactions using some of the benefits of the prepaid platforms, which are, you know, being real time, but also having the ability to do very selective authorizations of transactions. That's the other thing, you know, we yeah. can be very tactical. Uh, but we will still work with a bank. I mean, we work with um, ClearBank, for example, uh, on, a pro on programs. So those you've got the benefit of having the regulated funds that are protected, although e-money yeah. is protected. You have the insurance. You have the ability to lend against it. But at the same time, that payment experience is a modern payment experience. And I think that's probably the future moving forward. Um, and it, it really will unlock a lot of the problems that the big banks have got, which is they're locked in this old world of payments, but they also have to obviously keep the deposits um, by opening up, you know, by open banking, by opening up um, sort of payment processing you and more companies coming into the banking regulation, you can have the best of both worlds. Mm. And so, I mean, you mentioned open banking. Uh, I guess it's interesting from a payment processor's perspective that new rails are coming along, whether that is payment initiation or account information through open banking, or whether it's something like crypto rails. Do you see any changes coming along to the MasterCard, Visa, Amex, you know, uh, I don't know what you call it, ol oligopoly? Um, well, obviously, I couldn't say that because uh, MasterCard is actually a shareholder in our company. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> crosses the line but it's fairly clear that you know you've got two things you've got branding you've got technology okay we've well, got three things you've got branding you've got technology you've got regulation okay and uh schemes you've mentioned sit in all three of those spaces um a lot of the um uh, eu um you know regulation over the last 10 years has been to try and break up those different services you know, so the technology sits separately from the branding, maybe sits separate from the regulation. So I think the schemes, what people, I think, think of them as just tech businesses, and I'm sure their valuations are based on that, but they're about trust as well. So, uh, and they've all obviously made plays into open banking and mm. obviously MasterCard uh, publicly have, have obviously bought Vocalink. So what they're bringing is the, sort of a technology neutral approach. So I think for sure, I don't think it's necessarily going to, uh, I suppose, break up those things, um, but it allows for more choice for the customer um, because money is about trust always, yeah? Mm -hmm. And, you know, why do people still pay 7% to Western Union 
um, and everyone says, well, that's crazy. Um, well, you know, if you're a worker in, in, in uh, Europe and you have a dependent in the developing world, uh, you don't really mind if you're paying 7% if you can guarantee that money gets there. So trust is an important part of financial services. So I wouldn't take that away. Um, so I, I guess before getting, or t- t- tell us, talk us through your career, both sort of where you're at now, what you're looking to in the future. And I understand that, that green fintech is now a, an interest of yours. Uh, talk us through the journey. What, my personal journey? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, st- I started life as an accountant, um, as, as all good uh, CEOs need to have a basis in numbers. Um, but very much in the business side of things. And I worked in retail. Um, and then I spent a few interesting years um, in, a, in a record company uh, in the 90s, which was eye-opening, uh, but developing sort of digital gaming uh, platforms. Um, then, as I said, I worked in the, the Economist for quite a while mm-hmm. and in, in other publishing spheres and saw how digitalization changes the whole business Mm -hmm. Um, you know, whether it is in the record industry, whether it's in publishing. And then I felt, well, it was natural when the opportunity came around. um, There was this idea about prepaid MasterCards. It didn't really exist in 2003. I thought, well, that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. But essentially, the business at the time was displacing paper gift vouchers, paper meal vouchers Mm -hmm. um, into a digital format. And I thought, well, that's pretty similar to what I've been doing before. So that's what attracted to me. I mean, what I I found our business, what's attracted me about our space, or generally the payment space, is it brings together um, technology, uh, which I've been very interested in working in, especially digital technology. It brings in regulation and compliance and, you know, as a as an accountant, you kind of you understand about governance and compliance and all that sort of thing. But also uh, working in retail, I understood that services need to be distributed in a, in a consumer friendly way. And, you know, our first prepaid cards we launched in retail environments. So we did a product with Virgin Money. You could walk into you know, a Sainsbury's and take a prepaid card off a hook. So it's basically it was a financial service product you could buy with your carrots and, you know, your groceries. <laughs> So those three experiences all came together, and I think I found a real happy medium at PBS. So what's led you into uh, into green fintech? So, you know, everyone's looking for business models, if we're all, you know, if, if we think about it realistically. Um, very few people come into, into payments with a, an objective not to make some kind of value, whether it's equity or whether it's, you know, financial, etc. And it seemed that, Um, this combination of the the huge socioeconomic uh, movements in terms of green was colliding with the tech side of things. And there was an obvious gap um, for companies to say, well, actually, with, you know, Generation, you know, Z and everything else, we can bring all of these things together and create something very special to fill that market in the gap. So I've always looked at partners beyond you know how much money do you think we can make or what are we going to provide it do i believe in my partner's business model that's always been important for us and frankly it's one of the reasons you know we've never really done gambling uh we've never actually done cryptocurrency uh and i'm quite happy to say that at this point um because we've had you know we never really fully believed that those businesses were sustainable um or that they had particular issues that we were not comfortable to deal with Whereas, you know, when I look at, you know, green finance um, and the opportunities there and the size of that opportunity, we feel it is a very sustainable uh, business to be in. So that's why we've really entered this space or we've, you know, participated with partners in that space. And how have you entered it? Talk, talk, talk to us about a few uh, examples. So, you know, we have, we, you know, we've got an open door to any customer who wants to talk to us. We've got a very active kind of team uh, on the sales side. Um, you know, good PR, good, you know, social networking. We work with, you know, the industry. It's a relatively small industry, as you know. And so we're always, op- you know, we've always got our ears open. Um, crucially, I suppose, we will listen to, you know, one person who comes to us and says, look, I've got an idea. 
Okay, mm -hmm. he might not or she might not have any money at that point or time, but I said, I've got an idea and I've got some backing. And a couple of the clients we've launched, we've done that. And PPS actually is probably quite unique in that we, we can play with the one person band who comes in. You know, we're not going to do a million pound setup integration, that sort of thing. Um, that's not my price list, by the way. So don't <laughs> uh, you know, one man band out there, what, you heard it here. Yeah. And the reason, one of the reasons I said that is one of our biggest clients at the moment, Tide Banking, um, it was one guy, George Beavis, who yeah. came to me. Um, and, you know, I always think it was George and his Brompton, who love me for saying that. And he used to pitch up in our office, park his Brompton in the corner, um, take off his, his cycle hat and then had these crazy ideas about banking. And we all know where Tide is now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't want to necessarily miss his opportunities. But we really enjoy you know, working with guys and, you know, in teams that have got ideas and have got energy, um, maybe, you know, I'm 56. So maybe it keeps me a little bit younger to deal with these things as well. So maybe it's a selfish benefit there. And have you seen any uh, really interesting propositions or, or particular takes that you think, actually, you know, that, that's a great idea? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we actually have been working for a number of years in this space with uh, well, our parent company. So we've got products, for example, in Belgium, where the government has said, you know, we will give you a certain amount of money um, to spend on your to give your employees uh, with tax benefits, provided they are used for ecological products. OK. So we have a product called EcoCheck and we're the processor and issuer for that. And, you know, customer goes into a supermarket and, you know, is only in a, there's only a certain amount of products that have got the label on that they can actually spend it with. Mm. Uh, similar product we work with in the US, whereby um, our client has teamed up with a, um, a health insurance company and our client uses the card to collect information on what people are spending in their daily, in their, you know, their weekly shop. And, you know, the products get scored and the, the health insurance company will give lower premiums to consumers who can demonstrate that their basket is healthier. And that's all come through the payment network. And those are some products that we've been doing for a number of years. Um, now we're working, we're also now working with startups who are going much more in terms of the environment. So traditionally, we've worked with kind of personal um, well-being, um, nutrition, which are all obviously important things as well. Um, more recently, we've launched a couple of clients um, who are using the payment platform as a means to change consumer behavior, reward behavior, and uh, around you know environmental spending, uh, or at least... Uh, social spending, which is then translated into some kind of environmental benefit and giving customers education as well about what the impact is of, of what they're spending. So, uh, yeah, we've got one client who are working with a, a partner that's able to calculate the carbon footprint of everything you buy. So, you know, I'm the, like a lot of people after Christmas, I mean, I'm using a, a calorie app and a health app and an exercise app. And actually, when you start getting into the measuring what you're spending in terms of uh, calories and what you're exercising every day, it changes your behavior. These guys are doing the same thing in terms of carbon footprint. So you can actually set yourself a carbon footprint target on what you're spending and you can decide I'm not going to buy that product because that one has a carbon footprint of X, this one's got a carbon footprint of Y. So in order to hit my allowance or whatever, I'm going to go with that one, which I think is, is incredibly powerful. Yeah, I mean, I guess consumer spending is the big lever to, uh, to change industry. Uh, I've been yeah. absolutely amazed with the number of uh, adverts you see now around uh, vegan you know, meat substitutes. Yeah. Who would have believed three or four years ago that almost every chain or every fast food uh, outlet now seems to be marketing uh, vegan meals. And so I, I guess, you know, being able to use data uh, and rewards and information about the, the people that you're uh, buying goods and services from is a, a big lever in order to make, that, make those changes. Yeah, I think, you know, everything is driven by consumer behavior. You know, there's no, there's no point in, you know, if you talk about calorie counting or diets, they all fail if you don't get inside the consumer behavior. There's a lot of companies doing that. And so, 
you know, uh, I, we used to do a program years ago with a utility business where the card would generate uh, a cashback uh, every time the customer spent. Now, the cashback itself every month wasn't a lot of money, okay? So maybe £10 a month. Mm. This product was aimed at, uh, I won't tell you it was, but the minis with pigs on the side that were driving around, you probably know who they are, and you'd see them. It was targeted very much at the the you know the person responsible for the household spend. Mm. So typically that would have been a housewife. I'm not hopefully I'm not being sexist there. And they were very very conscious about saving money for the family. It was like more important than the money itself. And this company used the very clever actually. Instead of just giving cash back onto your bank account, they took the cash off the utility bill. Mm. So the the housewife could say at the end of the month, I've saved on our electricity bill because of my spending behavior. Yeah. Kind of psychological way of approaching it. And I think the example where if I'm buying certain goods, um, but actually I hit my carbon uh, footprint, it gives me a, you know, it's more than just the spending. It's more than just a financial thing. So mm. these propositions have to, touch the human psyche and you know we i suppose in a small way when we were in you know we're in the gift card business a gift card is you know it's 50 quid that you can spend in a supermarket well yeah. that's exactly like cash but the fact is it's valued more than cash because someone has taken the the time to think oh well you know mm. you really like uh, events so i'm going to get you a ticket master card because I and then you'll remember that event that it was yeah. me who gave you the card for that. So a lot of that we're seeing, and and the startups really get that. You've got to get the consumer under, under you've got to get under the skin of the consumer. You've got to align yourself with the interests of the consumer. Uh, so we just sit in the background and, and help that happen. It's the real well, bright diamond who are coming uh, to us. You know, I, I guess you um, you know you brought up earlier the fact that you can do real time. Uh, authorizations also means that you can do real-time uh, rewards and, and actually yes. behavior change that we know whether it's you know training your dog to sit or potty training you you know your young daughter um, is all about like in the moment rewards uh, and that yeah. that isn't something that really the traditional rewards industry has been into you know you get your nectar points or your air miles or your mm -hmm. cash back at the end of the month in a statement but it's very different from getting something, uh, a, a variable reward when you're actually spending. And I think, you know, with some 11FS clients across the world, that's a, such an interesting area, the, the real time variable reward space. And especially when you can combine it with a social good, you can actually make behavior change happen um, with these little, you know, little nudges, I guess. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's the notification we're talking about as well. Um, you know, our, our products enable all of the information on the spending on our platform to be delivered in real time through a notification to an endpoint. And the customer, you know, our clients can then decide what they want to do with that. So, you know, if they do see, you know, a purchase coming through from Whole Foods or something, we we'll, they will see that in real yeah. time. And then they can, you know, immediately deliver, you know, a reward through the app to their customer to say, congratulations, you know, this is your 12th trip to, you've hit your 12 visits to Whole Foods this, this week, yeah. you know, you got a bonus. It's a bit like, I don't know if you use Strava, but the challenge, I love the challenges on Strava because you're just doing it and then suddenly, boom, okay, well done, you've done enough Ks this month to hit your challenge and you got your little reward. It's crazy, stupid stuff. But it's kind of how our brains work. You know? <laughs> yeah. And the, you know, the online marketers, whether it's, uh, you know, Facebook ads or Google ads or whatever, yeah. you know, are expert at, at taking data and suddenly uh, getting the, the right what they think are the right kind of ads to you in the moment. I guess yeah. it's going to be interesting to see how payments and the, the notifications and, and details around it then lead to, you know, to the, the rewards 2.0 in the real world and how that you know how that develops from there because i can i can really see that be becoming the next big you know ad platform value add services beyond the traditional you get a penny for every you know 10 pounds you spend or here's one air mile for every particular um, journey you take or something
Yeah, exactly. And I think, obviously, the way that Google have, have revolutionized advertising by the precision and the targeting uh, and therefore the conversion, then I think payments can do the same because the ability to, in the moment, promote a particular purpose or brand uh, is very valuable to, well, frankly, to, you know, brands uh, and causes, as I mm. said, you know, uh, slightly off track, but during COVID crisis in, in some of the markets, particularly in France, um, the where restaurants weren't open, customers couldn't spend, you know, their amount, their, their allowances. So what we were able to do was to increase the amount that could be spent maybe at a supermarket. So actually, rather than, you know, because customers couldn't go to restaurants during the day, they weren't at work. So they built up a lot of money on their cards, but they couldn't use it. And there was a limit on how much money you could spend in a supermarket. So we were able to actually increase the limit. So literally convert people moving into supermarkets mm. so you can actually spend your social your shop and that payments has that ability to do it you know the example of the eco check a, a transaction would actually be declined if it was deemed to be you know not suiting the social purpose which is a mm. little bit probably more the, the stick than the, the carrot <laughs> um, but that whole space of rewards where as you say there's a battle between the retailers and the brands, the retailers at the moment control all the data. Mm. Okay. The brands don't really control. They have, they have much less granular data. Mm. Obviously they'll know their market share, but a retailer will know at three o'clock, you know, on a Tuesday, you know, X, Y, Z brand was bought by X, Y, Z yep. profile customer. So I think the payment industry can actually redress the balance a bit. Yep. Because we work with brands, we work with, you know, companies that could actually use our products to maybe say to a retailer, well, we, we know when our brand is being spent because we're seeing the payment data itself yep. as well. Yeah, I, I think there's going to be massive growth in, in that space. But unfortunately, we've, we've just about come to the end of our allotted time. Um, I want to uh, uh, finish off by asking you one last question, um, which you, you can have, answer how you like related to fintech or not. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> uh, my younger self? Well, I can't remember my younger self, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> did I mention that I worked uh, for a record company in the 90s? You so there's probably a lot of advice I would have given that person. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in prison right now. I think the, the, the advice that I, I would give them, and ge this is genuine actually, were, and this is something I've learned over the last 10 years, particularly as being a CEO and responsible for the business I'm responsible for, is um, don't, you know, I think um, Wellington or someone said, you know, whatever is first reported is never actually the final outcome. And we all have to deal with ups and downs in our careers and our personal lives. And the danger is always to follow the ups and follow the downs, you know, and actually you need to moderate it because in the end, life is like that. You know, there's always a path through it. And particularly I'm thinking about when we've all had really bad days or we've had crises to deal with, you know, or problems, you know, you feel as down as you can be and you think the world is finished and you think, you know, that's it. You know, my career's over and I'm a great fan of a sports psychologist who used to work with the French rugby team about toxic thoughts where, you know, if you play, if you have a bad game, human nature is to think, well, I'm going to be dropped from the team. Uh, that means I'm going to, you know, not play again. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my wife and I'm going to end up on the street just because you have a bad game. It doesn't work yeah. like that. So I would tell definitely my younger self, you know, you've got to take the, you're going to take the downs, you're going to take the ups. Um, but in the end, a year after, six months after a crisis, it never looks as bad as it did when you're right in the middle of it. That's probably what I would say. But that's all exacerbated in a startup CEO slash, you know, process yeah. CEO. I mean, talk about roller coasters. Yeah. Well, COVID is a great example. I mean, those first, the first few weeks of COVID, we all thought, oh, my God, the world is going to end. And obviously, ironically, in our business, um, other than obviously all of the disruption and we'd all rather COVID never happened, 
purely selfishly from an, from a business point of view, it's actually been incredibly positive. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, volumes, e-commerce volumes, fintech volumes have actually rocketed because of it. So even in the darkest moment of thinking the world was going to end, there was actually a, a pretty positive outcome from a, one perspective of it. Obviously, we'd rather it didn't happen. And we're all, all looking forward to it. You know, going its merry way and doing what it wants, so we can all get back to some sort of normality. <laughs> well, Ray, thanks for joining me. Where can people find out more about you and everything you're getting up to? Uh, yeah, so well, I'm on LinkedIn. PPS is on LinkedIn. Um, so search PPS, search for Ray Brash, and you'll find us. And thank you. That's all we have time for this week. Make sure you follow Eleven FS on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram as well to stay updated with all the cool stuff we're doing. And if you enjoy our show, do subscribe to the 11FS YouTube channel where you can catch up on previous episodes. Thanks, Ray. Have a great week, everyone. Goodbye.